Dude, I love the Birkenstock dude, story. Dude, the Birkenstock IPO coming in, I'm hearing indications around possibly an $8 billion valuation. I was valuation. the same thing, 8.2, I think. There's like a legitimate case that the Barbie movie has pumped up demand for, for the company. It's funny to me that Birkenstock is back to being a huge, ugly footwear fashion trend because when I was in middle school, Birkenstocks were like the coolest thing in the world. It was Abercrombie and Fitch, you know, terrible Abercrombie yeah. and Fitch cargo shorts oh my God. and Birkenstocks. And if you're a real nerd like me, it was Burks with socks. Oh <laughs> God, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, those were those were days that we don't we don't want to talk about. We don't about. want to talk about um, shame. But, yeah, but yeah, the Burks are back. By the way, I learned that Birkenstocks is a 250-year-old company. Yeah. I mean, what the hell? I didn't know those things have been around <laughs> since monks were wearing them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 30 of the Atlas Pod. It's a milestone episode. Big milestone. And we're also celebrating officially getting to 100,000 downloads Hell of yeah. the pod. It took us like six months to get to 50K downloads, and then we did another 50K in like six weeks. So Was it that fast? I didn't even realize. Yeah, it's been that fast. So thank you to everyone who's been watching and supporting the pod. Please, if you haven't already, make sure that you hit that subscribe button, like and share the content with all of your friends. We greatly appreciate it. Helps us out a lot with the YouTube algo gods. All right, brother, what are we drinking? All right, man, they say you are what you eat. Today we got highly skilled. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a tradition for me now. Cheers, man. Cheers, man. I also don't know how I always end up with the one that's shaken up. I don't know. It's I think like, it's your form. I'm, I'm sabot. Yeah, it's my I form. It's, it's got to be. I'm like self sabotaging here. All right. So, want to start off this week by talking about China. The Chinese economy is falling off a cliff. President Xi Jinping has called it the once in a hundred year storm. So this is it's all not dramatic at all. Yeah, that's not dramatic at all. And that's him calling it that. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is all about the Chinese real estate bubble, which has finally popped. This week, we got a bankruptcy filing from Ch China Evergrande, um, the second largest developer over there, over $340 billion USD in losses. They owe another $140 million to various vendors and counterparts. Uh, Country Garden and Sino Ocean are also out with warnings. This comes after like a two-year account review and then eventual restatement. And the thing that people should really get a grasp of as before we dive into the details here is that real estate is integral to the Chinese economy. It is as integral to the Chinese economy as say oil is to the Saudi Arabian economy. They're part and parcel, you know, there's no separating the two, inextricably linked. So how goes real estate? How goes the Chinese economy? And that's layered, right? Um, at, the, at the state level, because they have a lot of state-owned developers, state-owned businesses um, at the local level and then at the actual individual citizen level. Everyone's got exposure to real estate, no two ways about it, if you live in China. Um, so how big is this problem? Well, currently right now they have, according to their own numbers, 65 million vacant homes across- That's according to their numbers, according which to their you numbers. have to assume are slightly padded. And we'll talk about that. 65 million vacant homes, so across 600 cities. Some of the cities themselves are what's being called ghost cities. We're talking about cities the size of Nashville, Tennessee, and the size of Atlanta, Georgia, the size of Paris, France. And because a picture is worth a thousand words, I actually pulled some of the photos of this. Dave, if you could throw this up on the, on the screen now, a little montage. And when I say the size of Paris, France, what I mean is a actual replica city. <laughs> Of Paris, France. It's crazy that they just build this stuff, man. Full with a with a full uh, scale replica of the Eiffel Tower. It's unbelievable when you see this picture. It's like I can't believe it. But nobody nobody vacant. lives there. No. So some of these units are sold and vacant. So the developer went out and they sold this, and then people just didn't move in. Um, some of them are unsold and vacant, so it's still on the developer's books. And then there's actually quite a few of them 
which are in the process of, of actually being completed. So they're still building it despite there being no demand for people to live in these cities. There's no, there's no more, a lot of them construction is halted, but the way that it works when you buy a new, a new construction, it works the same way in America is developer will say, okay, I bought a piece of land. I'm going to build this building. Building has 500 units. If you want to buy one pre-construction before we actually break ground on it, you get a lower price. It's a third, a third, a third. So you put down a down payment. When the project's half completed, you put down your second payment. And then the day you move in, you put down your third. So some of these people have given one payment. Other people have given two. And now they're being told, like, the project's halted indefinitely. Construction stopped. You know, too bad, so sad. That sort of thing. Unreal. Um, so markets got hold of this this week. I think that was largely why, you know, the market started to trade down. Um, what do you think of this and, and how big of an issue do you foresee this being as we move forward? I mean, this is a massive issue in China specifically, but there's global implications, which we'll have to get your thoughts on as well. I mean, when you think about a country that has so much money tied up in real estate yeah. and it's, it's like a domino effect where if you're an investor and you put your money in something, you know, they, by the way, the Chinese uh, economy has this huge shadow banking sector, right? Shadow banking being like outside of the traditional and regulated. Yeah. So talk, uh, talk about system. that a little bit, just so that people understand they don't have community banks. There's right. A lot of I mean, banks. so there's, there's a lot of restrictions for the banking system within China, whether it's uh, who they can lend money to capital requirements and so on. So during the rise of the Chinese economy, a lot of these banks were not able to meet the demand of the Chinese consumers who, you know, wanted to buy homes, wanted to do business, yep. et cetera. So the evolution of the shadow banking sector was a big part of that growth. And like, just as an example, like one of the components of that are these trust companies, yep. uh, one of which just went bankrupt uh, this week, which has led to a lot of uh, investor panic. And these trust companies basically pool money from wealthy individuals companies and part of that is lending activity and then part of it is investments. Yep. A big part of those investments is in real, real estate. estate. So there's a lot less of these stocks, uh, bonds, et cetera. A lot of it is in real estate. So if you invest your money in one of these trust companies and now the trust company says, look, Tobias, you're a high net worth individual living in China. You've put in, you know, hundred thousand dollars and we're going to pay you 7% return on that. Yep. And on the back end, I take that money and I invest it in this brand new Paris in China, real estate development, and now that real estate development crumbles, I'm not getting my return as a trust company, and therefore I can't pay you. Yep. So it spreads throughout the economy, and the trust is just one component of it. I mean, the, the real estate contagion is pretty widespread. So I'd say it's, I'd say it's quite a serious issue, when, especially when you think about the fact that 21% of the young Chinese people are unemployed, and the majority of the people's wealth in the country is tied up in real estate market, and real estate prices are, are either flat to down, like that's a that's a pretty serious situation. I right. mean, am I am I overstating that? No, you're not overstating it at all. Maybe understating it actually. <laughs> so the stat that you just threw up. So one of the things that's changed materially since Xi Jinping has become president is the amount of data that the National Bureau of Labor Statistics um, or Economic Statistics in China publishes. So when he took over, there was about eighty thousand different data sets that they would release to not only their own people but to the rest of the world. So the rest of the world had a pretty good understanding of like what was going on in China. And he, he's undertaken a slow but very aggressive campaign to cut down the amount of statistics that are being published. Today, there's less than 10,000 data sets that are published on the Chinese economy. So it's down roughly 90% over the course of the last like 12 or 13 years. One of the most recently suspended data sets is unemployment rates for young people which just hit 21.4%. We're talking about people in China, 24 years and younger, which is an all-time high. And because it hit- an 21%, all, 21%. That is a staggering number. In the US, we debate about 3%, 4%, maybe 21. 5% unemployment. This is 21% amongst the young people who right. are supposed to be the driving force of the, of the economy. Right, so you think about how this plays out. Okay, there's no jobs for young people. That means they stay at home with their parents much more often, much longer. Um, and that means that there's no demand for entry level housing as a result of that. So these places are vacant. In fact, the most popular job now in China for young people is being their parents' child. <laughs> to throw this up on the screen. <laughs> what? What are yeah. we talking about here? So there was a <laughs> cultural shift, or not a cultural shift. Like in Chinese culture, if you're a child, you're expected to take care of your parents. You do that for free. It's just like 
part of the, the that's just part of the culture you know part like of the you culture. want to give back to those who you know you took grow care of up you. your parents you know they fed you they clothed you they housed you you went out into the world you made something of yourself you got some money now you got to repay it on the back end well they don't have jobs so now they go into their parents who they're supposed to be taking care of and they're saying look you got to pay me to be your caretaker pay, pay me to be your child what a hustle man which is unbelievable and it's actually in the wall street journal and everything it's not a joke so you know there's that issue the second i think really bigger issue is that they just got this demographic problem completely wrong from the get-go when they decided that they were going to start building this. In 2008, when we had the real estate bubble burst in the United States, that was largely driven by speculation. So you had people that were going to the bank, taking out ninja loans, no income, no job. <laughs> ninja loans. Yeah, ninja loans. <laughs> Um, and they were buying, you know, a second property, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. They were trying to either flip it or they were renting it out. Or in the worst cases, they were buying a place they had no business buying just for personal consumption. But we were never in a situation where we had an excess amount of housing. I mean, think about the environment yeah, that I mean, we're there, in. There is a structural shortage of housing. Structural shortage and a material shortage of affordable housing across the entire country, particularly bad in, in coastal cities like LA, for example. But in China, if you look at their, at their demographics, the United Nations is projecting China to have a decrease in population of between 100 and 200 million people by the year 2050. So they're going to lose, you know, let's say take the average 150 million people from their population. And then by the year 2100, their base case assumption is that it's around 750 million people living in China from an all-time high last year of almost 1.5 billion. 50% decline. So it's a 50% decline. So you have all of these projects that have been built. You have the trust companies that are invested in them, the insurance companies that are invested in them, the banks that are invested in them, and there's nowhere to go with this. So are you, you're saying that they have a declining population, pretty drastically declining, if you think about a 50% yep. decline over Very the course aggressive. of the next 60, 70 years, but they have a massively increasing housing supply. Yes. So yeah. Because the way that the system in China works is once you have this asset, so like let's just say you you get a loan from a bank or from a trust company or whatever, and you go and you build a ghost city. Okay. Well, in the most ideal circumstance, people would move to that city, they would start paying rent or they would buy the property off of you. And then you could like provide some sort of return to the investors and like everyone would be fairly happy. But because they don't want to wait for that to happen, as soon as the buildings start going up, they go to a second investor and they say, oh, this building, which we took out a billion dollars to build, is now worth two billion or three or whatever. And they take out another loan against that. And in the process, they pocket yeah, a nice little million. dividend recapitalization exactly. scheme. They got so it's like on. this equity, a cash out equity refinancing, but layered and layered and layered. Um, and like the government was basically the one that was supporting this because they're the ultimate bag holder. Like at the end of the day, right in China, it doesn't operate like it does in the United States where there's a separation between private industry and the government oh, lo loosely separated, <laughs> loosely separated, <laughs> becoming yeah, converging. Yeah. Um, the situation now is, you know, the government is, they have, they have ultimate ownership of, of all of these things. Yeah. So like, I mean, that's, that's the tricky part for, for China that they're contending with right now because, like this trust company failed. I think they had about $140 billion in assets. Yeah. Now, you know, some people are saying like, well, why don't, why doesn't the Chinese government just bail them out? Of course that's an option, but it's not like trust companies. It is and it isn't. Yeah. Like it, they're not like as integral a part of the economy yeah. as, you know, a big bank would be. So it's like, all right, if we bail out a trust company, what does that mean? So maybe we draw the line a little bit further and say, no, probably not the trust companies. Maybe, you know, if we see a small bank fail, maybe we'll bail them out. Or, or is the line at the city level banks, like where, where does that line exist? And I mean, I think at this point, the trust companies are probably on their own. They're, they're probably gonna have to fend for themselves. I think it goes beyond that though. I mean, I, I think about it at literally like the highest level, like China as a country and, and as an economy needs to go through a debt refinancing of their entire debt load, right? Right now they're running a 300% debt to GDP ratio. So everyone's been talking about, not everyone, but a lot of the, like, you know, the Twitter sleuths and, some of the more pessimistic people as it relates to the United States are talking about like the rise of China, China replacing the United States and the US dollar. Yeah, all, this, the all these US currency. declinist uh, influencers. Yeah. And so like that narrative got really, really popular in 2022 when the US economy was going through some difficulties. It was popular even in, in the early part of 2023 before the markets ripped. 
Um, so now like the thing that I've been saying on the show over and over again is that when you're talking about the global superpower, the world's reserve currency, the most, uh, the best markets to invest in and the best markets to operate in, it's not an absolute game. It's a game of relatives, right? So the United States relative to the next best option, which presumably would be China, just given the size of their economy relative to ours. Well, now we're, we're, it's pretty clear that China's in serious trouble. So what does a debt refinancing for them look like? Ray Dalio actually has an entire book on this, which is kind of amazing yeah. that, you know, he's, he's already written. I mean, a book he's on been this. prescient and, and very well ahead of a lot of these things. And I got to give a shout out to him because he like really creates this yeah. kind of content that's digestible amongst all, all levels of intelligence and yeah. experience, which, you know, has been helpful, I think, for a lot of people in understanding what the hell is going on in the economy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but in it, you know, he, he mentions two things that are sort of fundamental to whether you're able to successfully refinance your, your debt. The first is what currency is the debt denominated in? So in China's case, is it denominated in Chinese yuan or in some foreign currency like the United States dollar? The answer for them is it's denominated in yuan. So that's like a positive, but with a caveat that I'll come back to in a second. The second is who are the holders of that debt? Are they foreign or are they domestic? In this case, the majority of the debt belongs to domestic Chinese citizens, which again is a positive for them in terms of being able to negotiate terms. Um, the difficulty on the first point, the denomination of the currency the debt is, the, the Chinese wants not a free floating currency, it's pegged to the dollar. So one of the early signs of this, there's always cracks, you can always see if you do the research analysis, is that the yuan is trading at multi-year lows, multi-decade lows versus the dollar yeah. already. I mean, you mentioned that on this show weeks ago, weeks, maybe yeah. even months ago. So now if they're going to print money over there to stimulate the economy and to pay back the debt, like that's going to get further and further out of whack. So then there becomes this delicate dance between the deflationary nature of a debt restructuring and the inflationary nature of printing money to then pay off the debts. Um, and can they orchestrate you know, the, the proverbial soft landing when they don't have the world's reserve currency status like we do, I would be in the camp of betting no. Yeah. I mean, the, I think the relative situation is, is very important to consider. I mean, when you see people, because it gets a lot of engagement when you're like, oh my God, the U.S. is on the decline, even the likes of Balaji, where he made that million dollar Bitcoin bet months yeah. ago, like a big part of his thesis and whether he says, you know, the time horizon that we've used to evaluate it is too short. But like a big part of it is like the US is down in the dumps. The government is, you know, messing up big time. Yeah. The Fed is printing too much money. You know, that is like alarmist and it makes people kind of sit up in their seat a little bit and pay attention. And it always sounds, we talk about this a lot, the bear case often sounds Smart. smarter than the bull case, but it doesn't mean it's right. Right. So if you look at certain numbers of the U.S. relative to the past, you're like, oh my God, debt to GDP is higher than it's been. And yep. you know, the interest rates are moving up or whatever, whatever metrics you look at, just look at the rest of the world. And it's like, okay, fine. Maybe you're not going to invest in the U.S. anymore. Where are you going to go? Oh, you're going to go to China? Right. Oh, you're going to go to Russia? Like, what are you going to, wh yeah. where are you going to invest? So the Europe. relative, the relative question uh, is very important here. I guess, what does this mean for Xi overall? So like, you know, the like China doesn't have elections like we yeah. have here. Yeah. So it's not like he's going to get voted out of office. And probably from our perspective, you know, we would be in the U.S. some of the last people to really know like what's going on For behind sure. the scenes. But when you talk about 21 percent youth unemployment, when you talk about a lot of value, a lot of people's wealth being tied up in a real estate sector that's on the decline, like that can't be good for him. No. What, like, what do you, what do you think that means for him or just like China overall? I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't like speculate on what a regime change looks like in China. Um, I have no idea. It's, I mean, we're like the last to know and the guy's trying to hide all the data points. Exactly. And like, I don't know, it could, could it be violent? Like, yeah, it could be. Um, but I think in order to attract foreign investment, like if they wanted to go out to the other civilized countries on the planet that have the money that can help them out with the restructuring, it would it would basically warrant like a full 180 in terms of policy. Like you would need to be more transparent. So like we would need to see all of the data. You would obviously need to stop a ton of the human rights violations that have been, you know, plaguing China for a very long time. 
there has to be a freedom of, of speech and a freedom of the press. There has to be the allotment and allowment of foreign investment into China and for foreign companies to be able to operate in China. There's no more, oh, if you're Amazon or Google or whatever. Yeah, you're you know, there's no YouTube. Yeah, no there's YouTube, no, and like we're, we're censoring out, you know, all of the websites that speak poorly or, you know, whatever about the Chinese Communist Party. Like all of that stuff would have to go away. I mean, that's a, and that's so, a massive 180. And so it's a massive 180. And so I, I just don't, see that happening like the 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 policy has been a more restrictive policy since he's Absolutely. come in right um and that's led to the disaster that they're in i also want to say you know you talk about timing and everything like playing the the short side of things is just really really tough um i've learned this lesson like over and over and over again because you're absolutely right like the short side the bear case it does sound more intelligent it sounds more intellectual. You want to be smarter than the people that are, you know, just buying the things that are up 10, 20, 30%. But timing is just so difficult. This issue has been going on in China for the better part of 15 years. I mean, I graduated college in 2011. One of the kids, one of the guys I graduated with, he wrote a senior thesis on the pending real estate implosion <laughs> in China in 2011. I mean, so that, uh, I mean, look, that's a good point because People have been talking about this in varying degrees of uh, urgency over the last decade. Like, is this one of those moments where things are really going to fall apart? Or is it just another one of those bumps where it's like, all right, this is obviously not good for them, but they're just going to keep chugging along for the next few years? I don't know. I mean, I think this is the most serious obstacle that they've faced since the financial crisis, for sure. Um, it also comes at a really inopportune time because – a lot of countries are moving manufacturing capabilities outside of China. For example, Apple, the new iPhone, is being assembled, at least in part, in India. We have the chip ban, so you're not able to manufacture chips over there. You're not able to sell certain um, high-performance semiconductor chips, including the AI chips, to China. So, And Biden has uh, just passed that executive order yeah, to limit uh, investment, investment in China. Investment in Chinese companies. Yeah, so um, I don't think it's like a speed bump. Like, I think this is, you know, like, I mean, stock what, traffic. What, can, what can they do? I, I know a lot of investors have been calling for more stimulus in the economy. I know they had some small rate cut. I yeah. Mean, are they are they doing enough right now? Do you think or not even they? close to enough? So they had a small rate cut. Um, the thing that they can do is they can start to raise additional cash. So one of the big arguments that is going on in the markets right now is that U.S. rates are going to continue to go up because China is a large holder of U.S. debt and their only like real way of being able to raise a large amount of cash very quickly is by selling down you know U.S. Treasuries. While that's true, they are the second largest holder of U.S. Treasuries. That number is only like eight hundred and fifty-two billion right now, which is down from like over two trillion ten years ago. I think they're one of the. I think they're the only top ten holder of U.S. debt that has less U.S. debt on their books now than they did ten years ago. Um, so they've already been selling down the debt. And when you think about the magnitude of what they could sell, like, you know, they're not going to sell it all, right? Maybe they sell 200, 300, right. 400 billion. Like U.S. Treasury already has to sell 3 trillion just to meet our own obligations over the course of the next six months. So uh, I don't see that being a problem for the U.S., but that's what they could. That's one thing they could do. They could start selling foreign holdings that are highly liquid. U.S. Treasuries being the top one. They could continue to to cut um, rates over there. CPI in China this week actually went negative. So they're experiencing deflation, not disinflation. So, you know, the stimulus to try to get things back to a, a moderate level of inflation, at least positive inflation, I think makes sense. Um, and then they, I think they have to go outside of China to look for, you know, some deals. Like they gotta, they gotta try to move some debt. Well, when it comes to when it comes to trying to combat deflation, they should take a page out of Powell's book. He, I'm sure he could. I'm sure he could tell. You never me miss an opportunity. You just never no, miss an opportunity. No, no. Um, yeah, I'm sure he could teach him a thing or two. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll I'll end by saying that this is like you know it's a yellow light for global markets, um, not necessarily a red light, but it's a yellow light. You know, it's caution. Right. We'll see how things play out. Um, it's it's. In a way, it's positive for the U.S. because, like, on a relative basis, we look a lot better. Yeah. Um, but and I'm sure in Washington D.C. they're they're very much thinking along those lines. Yeah. Plus, there's also second and third order effects. Like, if Russia was going to be reliant on China to escalate the Russia-Ukraine conflict, like that's off the table. Right. 
um, if China was harboring some sort of intent to invade Taiwan, you know, in two years, that's off the table. So there are certain tail risk events that get get basically negated, canceled. Um, I don't know whether or not the market was like really pricing that in though. Yeah. Okay, let's move to the IPO market. Let's go. There's really no been no IPOs. This year we've had 14 billion dollars in IPO issuance through what are we at? August 18th of of this year. Same time in 2021 we were at 241 billion. <laughs> so, gives you an idea of how lopsided it's been, how quiet it's been, frozen basically. But I think 2024 is going to be a blockbuster year for IPOs. And we're getting the first one out of the gates. Instacart is going to go public. It's huge. It's huge. Um, they're filing paperwork. Now, they've probably hit the hit the market in September timeline, maybe October. Um, but the reason why this is a big deal is because there is a backlog of growth stage companies that basically – have been waiting for the IPO market to be conducive enough to launch the company into the public because they don't want to do another round in the private markets to see their valuations get absolutely slashed. Instacart, for example, I think they were at 39 billion at peak and they're raising at eight to 10 right now. So it's down 75%. Now in the private markets, given where VCs are right now and their hesitancy, I think it could have, like, if you have to raise right now and you're a growth stage company that had some asinine valuation, like, you could be, it could be worse than that. Uh, there's a company. I mean, it could be impossible. It could be impossible. Like, I think there's probably a lot of companies that have raised at unicorn valuations that are simply not going to make it. Well, there was, I mean, Hopin is a good example. They were a uh, COVID darling. The company did virtual event planning, virtual event live streaming. Um, reached like a $7 billion valuation in 2021 on the back of all their COVID success. They just sold their core product for 15 million bucks to re to Ring Central. 15 million? 15 million. Jeez. And I hear it now, by the way, Ring Central, which I've been pretty bullish on, I hear, I'm starting to hear their ads. These guys are taking a completely different marketing approach. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it has something to do with the acquisition of Hopin. Right, exactly. So I want to talk a little bit about like how – I think this plays out and like how an IPO kind of works and like how a bank thinks through pricing these. So the first thing that people should know is when you look at the parties in an IPO, like on the sell side, you've got a company, a startup in this case, like let's call it Instacart. And then on the buy side, you have hedge funds, mutual funds, asset managers that are clients of the bank already. And like the, the bottom line is that the pricing is always going to go in favor of the buyers. Why? Because the buyers are there, they're coming into your shop every day and they're transacting. They're trading with you, they're buying research from you, they're using your prime brokerage services, you know, they're buddy buddy with like a number of different people across the entire sort of capabilities of the bank. And they want to make money and the bank wants to make them money because if the bank makes them money, then they can pay them back in the form of trading revenue, trading commissions, research, so on and so forth. So I would expect a lot of these companies that are coming public to be priced very cheap. Like I think the the pitch to the founders is, look, as you just said, you guys have been waiting for a year and a half, two years. Um, you're you have an opportunity right now to go public. If you don't go public, who knows? Yeah, right? and they and they can definitely point to situations like Stripe, like even Databricks missed out. Like they were they were supposed to go public. A couple of years ago, yeah. they missed out. Now they're then they raised money in the private markets. Now they're coming back, and I think what you're talking about more broadly is just that the leverage has shifted a little bit away from the companies and the founders towards the investors, uh, whether that be VCs or public market investors. Yeah, exactly. Um, which means that I think for the first time in a long time, if you're a retail investor that's looking at some of these companies, you're going to get great valuation. I mean. There are a lot of these companies that have better operating metrics. They have higher revenue. They have better gross margins, better net retained earnings now in 2023 than they did two or three years ago when they were valued at four times yeah. what they're going to be going public. I mean, for. because the reality is in order to go public now, the bar is a lot higher so in order to higher. raise money at all. But certainly to be a, a viable company in the public markets, like whether you're a tech company or not, which have famously gone public right. at hugely unprofitable <clears throat> levels, you need to have a demonstrated path to profitability. You need to have a seasoned management team. You need to be 
demonstrating that you have the operational capabilities to be a public company yeah. because the operational requirements of being public versus private are very different. So, yeah. you know, on top of that, you also want to be able to show that you can sustain high and robust levels of growth. The bar is just that much higher. So, you know, if you if you are an investor, whether retail or not, like, yeah, you're, you're probably going to get a much better deal. But I mean, this is a positive thing, though, for markets. I mean, yes, the markets are up a lot this year. And yes, we did almost make a new all-time high in the S&P and, and QQQ. I mean, we were within, I think, 5% of an all-time high before this most recent little sell-off. But no companies were able to go public. So if the capital markets exist to provide financing to companies so that they can continue on the path to growth, like that's the, the that's function, the, purpose of, the purpose of a capital market. So for there to only be $14 billion of issuance in a market that just went up you know, 30% in, in terms of NASDAQ, um, you know, something's missing and what's missing is new issuance. So for these companies to be able to go public, I think speaks to the underlying health of the market. Now we'll see like how successful they are. There was a, uh, electric vehicle maker Big out of, fast. yeah, out of, uh, Vietnam, right? Yeah, Vietnam. They went public either this week or last week and didn't go so well. Yeah, I mean, look, these EV companies kind of, I feel like they kind of saturated the market yeah. between Rivian and Lucid and all these Neo and all these companies. So, you know, VinFast was actually a highly anticipated IPO and didn't go as well, surprisingly, like just from a perception uh, and investor sentiment perspective as companies like Kava. <laughs> like Kava, Kava crushed their IPO. Crushed it. Um, which I, uh, to be honest, was not expecting really? at all. Yeah, I don't know. Have you have you gone? To, just tell people what Kava is. It's a restaurant. Kava is like a fast casual restaurant. Yeah. It's like the Chipotle of Mediterranean food and nice. it's supposed to be like locally sourced and, you know, delicious meals. Like I like Kava. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. They We can get into the financials of it. They acquired like Zoe's Kitchen and, you know, that allowed them to increase their footprint at a much lower cost as opposed to opening up new stores. They've kind of already finished the conversion of Zoe's Kitchen. So, you know, I, I believe the CapEx going forward is going to be a lot higher in order mm -hmm. to generate the same amount of revenue. But anyways, Kava, regardless of that, the, the IPO did well. Um, there are a lot of really exciting companies that are, you know, as you mentioned, like kind of pent up demand. So just to like rattle off a few Stripe, obviously, yeah. Databricks. This is kind of a funny one. Um, and back uh, by L. Catterton, uh, which happens to be one of our investors, full yep. disclosure, Birkenstock. You know, I love the Birkenstock dude, story. Dude, the Birkenstock IPO coming in, I'm hearing indications around possibly an $8 billion valuation. I was valuation. the same thing, 8.2, I think. Yeah, and the funny thing about Birkenstock is that there's like a legitimate case that the Barbie movie has pumped up demand for for the company because I don't know if do you- Do you think it's just because we live in LA? I don't or know, Or do you man. think this is a- Because everywhere I go, all I see is Birks. Yeah, no, I, it's everywhere. I, I went to a wedding in- Godforsaken Rochester, Minnesota, and Rochester. people, were, yeah, and people were wearing Birkenstocks there. And there's that one scene, not to spoil it for people, but like there's a scene at the end of Barbie where Mar Margot Robbie is wearing Birkenstocks, and yeah. like that alone has stimulated demand for the company. Um, so like that's a that's an interesting one. But there's so many cool ones like uh, on the know. Birkenstock thing. Just real quick, it's funny to me that Birkenstock is back to being a huge ugly footwear fashion trend because when I was in middle school, Birkenstocks were like the coolest thing in the world. It was Abercrombie and Fitch, you know, terrible Abercrombie yeah. and Fitch cargo shorts. Oh my God. And Birkenstocks. And then if you're a real nerd like me, it was Burks with socks. Oh <laughs> God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That those were those were days that we don't we don't want to talk we about. We don't want to talk about um, shame. But, yeah. But yeah, the Burks are back. By the way, I learned that Birkenstocks is a 250-year-old company. Yeah. I mean, what the hell? Are you kidding I me? Those things have been around <laughs> since monks were wearing them. In yeah, the they chapels. Had the, they had the Buddhist monks <laughs> rocking Birkenstock, and somehow now we got Margot Robbie and Barbie rocking yeah. them. So, but Al Catterton bought them for four billion dollars. They're a private equity company, and in addition to being a venture capital company, they bought them for four billion bucks. Uh, I think in like 2020, 2021, went on a series of like you know uh, let's call it brand repositioning, marketing campaigns, um, and now they're bringing them public two years later at an eight billion dollar plus valuation. And if this trend is really something, if what I'm seeing in LA is similar in terms of the number of people that are that are wearing Birkenstocks at all different places in the country, like the stock is going to absolutely rip. I love it. Um, what are the other ones that you're excited so about? So we got Birkenstocks. Well, obviously, like top of the list for me, particularly being in fintech, we got Stripe, mm -hmm. we got Chime, we got Klarna, yep. and then kind of beyond the fintech landscape, and there are some others there, but beyond fintech, SpaceX, SpaceX, obviously, uh, Starlink, 
which is a, would, would be a spin out of SpaceX. Would they do them separately? I think they could. I think there's a case to be made that that is a standalone company. The revenue model is a little bit different yep. than the rest of the than the rest of SpaceX, and it could benefit not only the company but just like the globe by and having unlocking just a yeah, ton of value. Yeah, unlock you know? a ton of value and be able to be a more well capitalized company to launch things into space. Like, come on, that's that's a pretty compelling story. Yep. Speak, staying on the the Musk trend, we got Neuralink, obviously. Um, which could, you know, that one, it, that one feels a little too early though. Yeah, for that's, that's probably more like 2025 or yeah. beyond. Uh, skims, which I think you mentioned, could Skims is out. going public next year for sure. They just yeah. did their latest round at four billion. Um, company's profitable. Yeah, of course, it's Kim K and the fam running. Absolutely that one. crushing. Um, Reddit is another one, which Reddit. I think they've been delaying for a little bit, and they had that whole story <laughs> with uh, their yeah. Own, they got in a fight with their mods. Yeah, it's so not the, good. The mods are not too happy. Um, yeah, there, there's a bunch. What about you? Are there any that I haven't mentioned that are on your list? I don't know. I haven't looked at the list uh, recently, but I mean, that's a good one. I would be interested to see if ByteDance could come. Yeah, ByteDance and other um, You know, with the China stuff going on right now that we talked about at the top of the show with the ban in with the potential TikTok ban um, floating around the halls of DC, it would be really interesting to see where that is priced. I think that at the peak, it was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like three to 400 billion It'd be interesting if they could take that public at at two hundred and even two hundred now. Yeah. Um, but look, there's a price for there's, there's a, price a price for, for everything. everything. You know, <laughs> like stock is trading in the private markets. There are people because a lot of the VCs that are holding it started to get out when you know when the the conversation about a TikTok ban started to gain a little bit of steam late last year, early this year. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, like that would be it would be interesting to see that one. Well, I've um, always I've always had my own theories about why the company hasn't gone public earlier, and that's yeah. because it's you know a CCP dominated uh, company. Yeah. Their priorities lie beyond profits. Right. Um, another, another that plus you have to like show the financials. You yeah, know? of course. Um, another interesting one which I which I have on my list here is OpenAI. I know we're a little bit early on that one, but you know they've taken money from Microsoft. Microsoft obviously enjoys having uh, that under their wing, but you know, as a value unlock, that might be a company that we see go public. In the How would that years. even work though? Because Microsoft owns fifty percent, so yeah. I guess they would just IPO fifty percent. Well, I put IPO the whole company, and then Microsoft would just not sell their stock. Yeah, either they just get converted to common shares, like the the rest of the investors. Yeah. Like so, every time a company IPOs, which is this is probably important for our for our viewers to understand, it's not always. Uh, them raising capital. It's also oftentimes just being listed on a public uh, public exchange and them selling secondary shares. So yeah, sure. It's a possible uh, opportunity for Microsoft to you know unlock some of that value for themselves. I don't know if that's their play, but you know that it that could be a huge company over the next few years. Could be could be one to keep keep on the docket. Got it. Um, anything else on the IPO market? No, I mean I think I think. Did you did you say you expect twenty twenty four to be the biggest year ever, or just like a no, better? just like a blockbuster year? Yeah. I mean, certainly relative to what we've seen in twenty twenty, what we're going to see in twenty twenty three, and what we had in twenty twenty two. Yeah, I mean, twenty twenty one was crazy, um, but I mean, I speak to a lot of people. Like, I have a lot of friends that are still on Wall Street. A lot of friends that are still in investment banking. You know, they were basically twiddling their thumbs for two years. Now, you know, normally this time of year, it's August, you're seeing pictures from people in Europe enjoying yep. themselves. That's not the case. Everyone's in the office right now. There's a ton of deals that are being worked on. There's a ton of pitch decks that are being put together for potential deals. Um, whether it's a combina- whether it's IPOs or M&A, I think it's going to be it's going to be a hot investment banking year in 2024. Absolutely. Um, startup M&A is also really interesting. I mean, you've got a bunch of companies, like if you think about the dynamics that exist within the startup ecosystem right now, you've got a ton of companies that have raised a lot of capital that are too early to even think about going public. They're still trying to figure it out. They're thinking about like, okay, what can I do for growth? Some of the markets that people thought we're going to be super easy to be able to acquire users and everything like that. It's turning out to be far more difficult. The products are still good if you can get people there, but customer acquisition cost is really high. And on the same, on the flip side of that, you have some other companies that are, you know, maybe further along with larger um, user bases that are just like out of money and maybe don't have the right metrics to be able to go to market and raise again. So there's a potential combination, merger, merger of equals, acquisition of uh, the bigger company by the smaller company or, or the inverse of that. So I think like startup M&A could be, and like that's not really an investment banking thing. That's just more founders 
being strategic right. and starting to say, okay, like, you know, two years ago we were head to head competitors. And, you know, today I think we need to be partners because if we put, you know, both these companies together, one and one could equal something, you know, greater than two. So, uh, interesting timing on that. We've been, we've been talking about certain options yeah. we'll get into right now, but yeah, yeah, that's certainly, that's certainly, uh, heating up in a way that we talk my own see. book. <laughs> yeah, Pro- but that's that stuff we probably didn't really talk about as much six months ago. I don't think you could get like every founder eighteen months ago thought the company was going straight to a unicorn valuation, yeah. right? And like for good reason because the data points that were in the market said you really only have to get five or ten million dollars in revenue, and then you're worth a billion dollars or whatever. And like now that's just vastly different. Yep. So. Um, Talking about company, a company that takes a lot of companies public, Goldman Sachs, not a good week for our guy, DJ Desol. DJ Desol has had a slew of these articles come out about him. This is the worst one, though. So, the New York Magazine. Yeah. Oh so for God, people that, that didn't see it, New York Magazine issued a scathing op-ed. Is it called an op-ed? Profile, I guess. A hit piece. Uh, a hit piece. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. It was a hit piece on David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs. They said that um, he's made a series of missteps as relates to his strategic stewardship of the business. There's also some very naughty, naughty things that he said. <laughs> some, some lewd read, comments. Read the article. Read yeah, the article some, and some lewd find. comments that he's made uh, in the presence of, of employees. But I think this is this is now at a point in time where it's unlikely that he maintains his role as CEO. Um, I know there's a lot of different takes on this. Like if you look at it, if you judge a CEO strictly on the performance of their stock price, technically I think Goldman's up like 50% um, since he's taken over. So like there has been value creation on, on behalf of the shareholders. But Goldman is one of those companies that even though it's the most prestigious brand in finance, they go to great lengths to make sure that they are a private, we go about our business, we don't really talk to the press, we don't do a ton of marketing, like that's just not their style, right? And to have not only an employee, but the head of the firm outed in like this most public of manners, that's just got to absolutely crush them. Not only the people in the company. It is the exact opposite of what they want. Like if you looked up and if you Googled Goldman Sachs, like any time prior to the last couple of weeks and months, like you would find like, okay, Goldman signs this deal or Goldman did this, Goldman did that. You don't find anything about like Goldman CEO is taking a private jet seven times in seven weeks to the Bahamas. He's DJing at Lollapalooza. This whole thing is, this whole DJ thing is crazy. Like in the New York Magazine article, he's out there saying, guys, Leave me alone about the DJing thing. Like you play golf, you play golf on the weekends. I like to DJ on the weekends. This is my hobby. And I think the board came back to him and was like, yeah, but nobody's ever died on the golf course. Like right. you're talking about these concerts where people are, you know, for better or for worse, they're doing drugs, they're doing crazy yeah, things. Yeah. Like that's not the culture of, of golf. And, you know, I don't know. It's also not the culture of golf. It's like the most it's the exact, exact opposite. opposite. But the thing that I really have a hard time squaring is like, how is DJ Desol a thing when everything I hear about him as an individual is like, he isn't friendly, he isn't fun. So talk about that, because that was in the, my, my perception from the outside looking in was you had this eccentric guy and, you know, whatever, he's he found a passion for music and DJing later in life, but was like a brilliant operator that was beloved by his employees. And, you know, it was like probably a breath of fresh air coming from like the Lloyd Blankfein era and a lot of the guys that just had like very sharp elbows and were very like about their business as it relates to running an investment bank in a world where Goldman was trying to become more like the tech clients that they seek to service. I mean, they were trying to become more like a big corporation that's a public company as opposed to like the wheeling and dealing Wall Street that they had previously. But that doesn't, I mean, you know, when the article- That doesn't square though, like it doesn't make sense. Like the article describes him as someone who's like very gruff, short temper, would in frequently in debates kind of like undermine to the point of being like personal where it's like, you know, oh, I, th- I think this about the strategy, I don't know, maybe perhaps we should pursue this. And the guy's like, you must be absolutely stupid if you think that. Yeah. And it's like, you hear that from your CEO and it's like, all right, well, this doesn't sound like the kind of person I want to disagree with, which, you know, when it comes to decision making is not the right approach. And one of the takes I've heard on this is that the reason that Goldman has had certain missteps uh, in recent years is not because David Solomon is someone who 
doesn't take advice from the people around him, it's because people were too afraid to give him advice. Right, which is the whole reason that apparently they got into this terrible situation with Marcus, where the the sort of culture which he was curating <clears throat> at the highest end of Goldman was like, when I'm what I say is is law and don't go against me. And like I'm really not open to hearing feedback on it. So when the decision was made that they were going to launch a retail version of Goldman Sachs um, to the mass market, totally different customer base, and that they were going to name it Marcus, a lot of people that were there, some of them were in the article that were named, thought it was a terrible idea. Some of them said some things, but a lot of them just kind of bit their tongue and went along with it up to and including like the people that were in charge of running the operation. Um, and then eventually they left. And so I think the number is like 200 Goldman Sachs partners have left over the course of the last few years since he's been CEO, which is like an unprecedented amount. There's only 400 Goldman Sachs partners, so like roughly 50, you know, yeah, exactly that's, 50%. That's definitely not, not a good look for the firm. And I think the risk here, though, is that if you look at the metrics and you look at the numbers, it's not like absurdly bad situation as if you were to read the article and you think like Goldman's falling apart, like the stock is up. 50% since he took over. Yeah. If you look at a longer time horizon, like on a 20 year basis, Goldman is up like 275%. That's higher than the likes of JP Morgan, which is up like 250%, higher than the likes of Morgan Stanley, which is I think 70 or 80%. So, you know, that's a longer time horizon. But 2021, I think Goldman was like the most profitable it's ever been. Um, right. Because the trading revenues. Yeah. Were, the trading uh, revenues were through the roof. I think they turned like $22 billion in profit. Wow. Um, you know, it's not like everything is bad, but the risk for Goldman is like, if we fire this guy right now, if the board mandates that, then are we just like caving to the media pressure versus, you know, actually assessing him under the the marks of what a CEO should be assessed by? But after a certain point, like it goes too far. And Goldman, you've mentioned yeah. the culture there, like every day you're fighting for your job. Well, I think that there's now, and there's blood in the water and there's a massive incentive for whoever thinks that they're going to be the next Goldman Sachs CEO to well, his be pushing boy, him his out. Well, his boy, John, John Waldron's number two on the list, apparently, but I'm hearing other names start to There's a few other, I mean, the one thing that will definitely be the case is it'll it'll be an internal hire. It yeah. won't be someone coming from, you know, another another company that comes in. Um, but you only there's only so many opportunities where you're going to be in a position where you could potentially become CEO, and the CEO that is in the chair right now, you know, is vulnerable. And, you know, if you miss the opportunity to take that spot, then you probably never get it again. So now's the time. I think well, that's a lot what of happened the, to Gary Cohn. Yeah, I think a lot of these I think a lot of these guys are are aware of that and more than likely sharks pushes in the water, out. man, like they know what they're doing. This whole. Yeah, but this whole situation is tough. I've heard Mike Mayo, who's like one of the most esteemed uh, people in the financial services industry, like one of the top uh, recipients of uh, CFA awards and so on. He's come out and said he thinks this whole thing is a little overblown and he thinks there's plenty of other CEOs out there at, at the heads of banking institutions who deserve to be replaced beyond uh, David Solomon. And then the issue is that the trading revenues have been partially subsidized by this foray into retail. And there's traders out there who last right. year were earning like six million bucks in bonuses and now it's only four million. Yeah. And they're pretty pissed about that because the culture at Goldman is that the comp keeps going up because you guys are crushing it. So that's that's kind of been the uh, impetus to the launch of all these hit pieces against Solomon. But I don't know. It's it's tough to say, but either way. What do you think would happen to the stock if if they gave him the boot? Well, the thing is, I don't think the stock would actually go up. Like, I don't think that there's like because part of what Solomon has done is like he's made it all about him. He's like, I'm the I'm the final decision maker on everything. So, like, it's not totally clear to me, like who the next person in line is. We've mentioned a couple of names, but like. There's not, in my eyes, like an amazing guy just waiting in the wings to take because over. Because it's not, it's not someone that's external. Exactly. Right? So, so it's like, like who? I don't know. I can't feel so confident that like, all right, David's gone, and now we're going to get like this amazing CEO. So like, it's tough for me to say if I like if I'm thinking from the investor perspective, if I see news that David Solomon is out, I'm like slamming the buy button because I know the next guy is going to operate the business right. better. I don't have that confidence. Right. What about you? Like, what do you think? I mean, I think that they're, they've already done the things that would be obvious for the new guy to come in and just start like chopping wood as it relates to getting out of businesses that clearly don't work. Like they've wound down Marcus and collapsed it within a broader consumer unit. Like I think it was Green Sky or Green yeah, Dot, one, whatever 1. it is. $1.7 billion. $1.7 oh. billion acquisition to get in home loan improvement or home improvement loan market, like terrible. Um, so, you know, it's not clear to me what like the big vision that you would pitch is seemed like some of the things that they were doing made sense. Like if you wanted to become 
more like a JP Morgan where you ultimately got to whatever JP Morgan now has, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of assets, you have to have a retail commercial operation. Um, so like, I think the strategy there, at least when pitched was something that investors could get on board with, obviously it didn't work out. So, you know, what does the new guy come in and say? He says, my vision is for the old Goldman, <laughs> you know, yeah. like my vision is that we are going to be the best on the street in trading in asset management and investment banking, period. Like that's then like that's yeah. the only and, business. And it's that basically I care about. like from my perspective on that is like it's basically like a cultural thing. Yeah. Like you you reinvigorate the employees at the company because like it or not, like Goldman Sachs is all about like the banking and the trading. And then you talk about retail and that's just like so eh. unsexy for these guys. Yeah. It's like, are you kidding me? We're talking about <laughs> retail. Like we we exist to serve billionaires and the multi-billion dollar corporations, not the guy who comes in and deposits a hundred bucks into a checking account. That's just the culture over there. So if you yeah. come in and be like, look, we're back, we're back guys. Yeah. You know, everyone's going to start getting paid up again. Like, you know, that's, that's the vibe that I think would be created. And that would be like the real benefit that the employees internally are like, all right, if I crush it this year, I'm going to get paid a massive amount of money. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, do you want to talk about Coinbase? Yeah, we, we could get into Coinbase, but really quick, I forgot to ask you this. Um, DJ D Soul, really yeah. quick, I gotta I gotta ask this man. DJ D Soul made his DJing debut. I read this in the New York the New York magazine article. Oh no. His DJ debut happened at Gurney's Montauk. Okay. Like if you were like looking at the weekend's plans, like what should I do? And you like see David Solomon DJing like somewhere near you. Are you going to attend a DJ D Soul DJ set concert? Like, is no. that something that you would ever do? No. Um, I've never heard his D I've never heard him play live. <laughs> I've never heard his music on Spotify He's or not whatever. On Spotify, man. I think if like if my assumption, I shouldn't say this because I, I haven't heard his music for all I know, it could be fantastic. But like my assumption is the only reason that he's relevant is because he's CEO of Gold. Yeah, okay. You know, so like I definitely wouldn't be augmenting weekend plans unless he was opening for someone that was just like great and <laughs> who could you know you could do it for before. just like the shock value of seeing Goldman CEO. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I, ha I had to slip that in there, but uh, yeah, coming coming to Coinbase, um, we got Coinbase and then we got Sam Bankman Fried. Oh my god! And Bitcoin had a little mini meltdown. Last yeah, that night. was bad. Well, so the coming to the last things first, Bitcoin's mini meltdown was a result of SpaceX saying that they dumped. Uh, nearly four hundred million dollars. Two there. years ago, yeah. So, People, like, what is but the going disclosures on? like came out or whatever? They released uh, their Wall Street Journal said they got wind of yeah. their financials. So, just so we have this, like, for the audience, there was a filing that happened yesterday that showed that SpaceX had basically sold all of their Bitcoin holdings. What is it, two hundred seventy million dollars yeah. or thereabouts in Bitcoin holdings in twenty twenty two, and the market in reaction. Bitcoin market went down like 9%. Yes. Um, in a very short period of time though. So it felt like something material. Because the thing with the thing with crypto is that a lot of the positions are levered positions. Yeah. And when you see the price move violently, then it leads to a cascade of liquidations of plus of, it trades 24 hours a day. Yeah, there's no and there's so no time off. Liquidity is not the same in the middle of the day when people are actually, you know, paying attention and awake and trading that it is when this came out, which I think on the East Coast was like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, you know, there's no, there's no one sitting in front of the screen. So yeah. So yeah. So the market can move a lot more violently yeah. in those situations. So uh, the Coinbase thing, I think was a, a pretty positive development for a number of reasons, which we can get into, but long story short, they received approval from the National Futures Association to begin operating as a futures commission representative what is it called uh futures commission merchant fcm so effectively they they will be allowed to offer futures uh, and derivatives products to their clients now coinbase has previously uh acquired a company called fairx which allowed them to effectively direct uh derivatives orders and futures orders to third parties so like different brokers this is kind of like the final missing link for them now they can serve as a broker in these transactions themselves and obviously earn uh commissions based revenue on that now this was an application that was first filed in September of 21. So like this is the culmination of a nearly two year long process. So obviously this is a big win for them because it unlocks uh, a huge addressable market. 75% of crypto trading volume actually occurs in the derivatives market and primarily offshore because in the US it's very difficult to get exposure there. So this is, this is a big TAM unlock for them, a big win for them. And interestingly, the there has been a 
lot of arguments and a lot of gripes about how the regulatory framework for crypto in the U.S. has been very unclear. It hasn't been established properly. And I'm starting to, to believe that this is actually a huge thing, huge win for Coinbase because they're like the only people who are, who are beginning to create this regulatory moat. Yeah. Um, you mentioned SBF, FTX was like trying to enter that position and now they're gone. So Coinbase is like the only company that's really able to operate. And right. They're doing the right thing. Yeah. They're going about it the hard way, which is to make sure that everything that they do is regulatory, re regulatory approved and right. compliant. Um, and a lot of these other people are trying to enter the market by doing things offshore and totally. whatever else. And like, they're going out of business, their, their founders are going to jail and that leaves Coinbase as the last man standing, which is obviously a positive thing, right? Yeah. So that's, that's a big, that's a big win for them. And in terms of like what the actual offering is, most of it is probably going to be institutional focused, but interestingly, Coinbase has 15%, and this is in the spot trading market, like when you just like buy and sell crypto normally, 15% mm -hmm. of their volume is from retail traders, but 95% of the fees come from retail because the fee structure is such that if you're a large and active trader, like an institution would be, your fees are way lower than if you're just like kind of a one-off guy. So 95% of their fees come from retail, even though only 15% of the volume comes from retail. I think the uh, futures products and derivatives products will be mostly institutions, but that doesn't mean that the uh, fee volume will be insignificant because even a little bit of retail volume can lead to to large fees. And they're going to be offering uh, four contracts, I believe, uh, two, uh, one Bitcoin-based contract, one uh, Ethereum-based contract, and then two like nano contracts, which are just like much smaller, which will be retail focused, uh, same product. So I think I think it's a big win for them. And you know the stock is up like 120 percent this year. Pretty pretty bullish on that as like the only the only real player in the U.S. crypto market. Yeah, real quick as we uh, get ready to wrap up, Sam Bankman-Fried now an inmate. He has been remanded into custody for violating the terms of his what is it parole probation? Yeah, I guess whatever it is before you get tried. Before you get tried. Um, what do you think of this man? So MDC, which is a, a Manhattan Detention Center, whatever. It's yeah, called. I think that it's different. The one that that Epstein got got killed in or killed himself in, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that one got shut down. So I think that was like the Brooklyn, oh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm not sure what the digs are like, but they're materially different than a thirty million dollar penthouse in the Bahamas. So the funny thing about this, I don't know if you saw this, but Martin Scarelli, who's made a name for himself in terms of giving advice to like disgraced founders, he was talking to he was he's talking to SBF. By the way, yeah, he. I mean, he's you know, he's, he's done well for himself after yeah. serving like a five year sentence. Let's get him on the pod. Martin Scarelli, if you want to come on the pod, <laughs> we'd love to have you as a guest on the pod. Absolutely, man. You're, you're welcome here. He's, he's a really interesting character. Brilliant. He's carved a very interesting niche for himself. So he's like been giving advice to uh, Sam Bakeman freed, like, you know, indirectly via the podcast circuit. But I think he also said he's going to write a memo for this guy on like what you should and shouldn't do because he <laughs> himself went to MDC for nine months before yeah. he got sent to prison <laughs> And this MDC, by the way, has also held other famous people like Jelaine Maxwell, who Got it. you know was working with Epstein. And his main, like his main advice for Sam is like, don't be a dick. Like you're you're gonna be in prison, and people are gonna think of you as a celebrity. So like, just regale your your crowds of people yeah. with stories of how you <laughs> regale. Yeah, you know, hold court and <laughs> talk to people about how much money you were moving around, and you were hanging out with Tom Brady and all these different guys. Like, yeah. he's like, as long as he does that he's going to be good. Right. If he comes in and is like on his high horse and doesn't want to talk to people, then then he's going to create problems for himself. Well, the problem is that he can't really talk too much about all that stuff because he's yet to go to trial. And this is one of the issues. So the reason why they, they took away the terms of um, his surrender where he was allowed to basically stay at his parents' place pending trial was because he was contacting both reporters and former employees. But really it was about the, the reporters. And obviously you're not allowed to violate the agreement that you made when you surrendered. Um, so that was stupid. And they'd already taken away his, his laptop and his smartphone. So I'm not even hundred percent sure how he was doing this. He's going to the public library and yeah. like shooting well, off messages. Like whatever he was doing. But the problem is that when you're him and you are a celebrity, you're really going to get tried twice. The first trial that you need to win is in the court of public opinion. The second is when you actually go to the Southern district of Manhattan and you're in that courtroom. But if you don't win the first one, good luck winning the second. And it's interesting timing because this week Netflix put out the Johnny Depp Amber Heard documentary. 
and you could just see like the entire trial is being covered on YouTube and Twitch. And like, you know, you've got all of these different content creators that in real time are watching the, the trial and then writing their own, like, yeah. you know, and like amateur the short, analysis the shorts of the trial were all viral, but, but a few of them are like, you know, armchair detectives. So when she showed the makeup, they were like, Oh, this didn't come out until after they were divorced. And then that made it to the jury, which then influences the jury. So the point is like all of these pieces, profiles that are coming out on Sam Bankman fried have been very negative for him. Um, and if he just sits there and takes the lawyer's advice, which is like, don't say anything, it's got to feel like by the time I walk into that courtroom, it's sort of a, you know, a preordained thing that like a predetermined thing. So that you I'm think this is why he like to. refused to comply and was like out there trying to influence the public? He was trying to talk to, I think what he did was dumb and like now he's in jail, like, but he's a criminal. So whatever, I don't feel <laughs> bad for him, but I do understand about like trying to control the narrative. Like generally, like the whole thing about crisis PR is, is controlling the narrative definitively not controlling the narrative is to not say anything. So then he, he, the only way that he could was to talk to reporters. And early on when this happened, he was way too candid with reporters talking and it got him in trouble because he was texting a reporter that he thought was a friend and it was on the record and they published it. it, you know, so he's for a person that, you know, was, was at one time being lauded as a super genius. Like he's made some really dumb mistakes. Yeah. And I think the truth is he's not a super genius, but what he is and the image that According to Martin Scarelli, he should lean into, he's a financial gangster. Financial so gangster. when you're in prison and you find these guys who are maybe like drug dealers or running credit card scams, maybe they've moved around hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions. Sam Bakeman Freed can come in there and talk to his subjects and be like, look guys, I've been, I've been hustling billions. You, th- you think you're big with a couple million dollar hustle? I've been hustling billions. And that's how he should survive right. in prison, according to Apparently, Martin. Apparently, uh, that's what Bernie Madoff did when he was in there and he was, he was the godfather of the place. Yeah, I mean, look, he might even be approached with some interesting business ideas. Well, we'll, we'll see what happens. Jesus. Uh, let's do the final trade. Final trade, let's go. Neymar just signed a two-year, $300 million deal with the Saudis. Is European soccer dead? European soccer is not dead, but Neymar made a mistake. He should have hit a bid at the MLS. <laughs> Donald Trump said that if he is elected, j Powell will be fired the very first day. Do you think that he makes it past 2024? j Powell's time at the Fed is transitory. Short this one. <laughs> the war of words between Zuck and Musk is heating up. Are these two guys actually fighting? They need to come to a decision one way or the other because I'm tired of this whole tirade. Short the fight. NVIDIA is reporting earnings next week and the street keeps raising estimates into the print. Do you think this stock is going higher? NVIDIA is the gift that keeps on giving. I could not be longer. SpaceX reportedly turned a profit in the first quarter of the year. Is this stock going to the moon? It is going to infinity and beyond. (laughs) Long SpaceX. Vivek Ramaswamy performed an impromptu version of Eminem's Lose Yourself. Is he the real Slim Shady? (laughs) Look, I cannot speak to the man's rapping skills, but I love what he's doing. He's young, he's energetic, and he's articulate. Long the Swami. Long the Swami. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching this week's episode of the Atlas Pod. Please make sure that you subscribe, like, comment, and share this week's episode. And as always, Shaval and I will be back next week with another episode.